Welcome to Chicago Jewish Cafe. Today we have an honor to have as our guest uh, one of the leading um, political scientists uh, regarding Eastern Europe and the uh, Ukraine and uh, Russia. And uh, this is our great honor. Uh, his name is Andreas Umland. He was born in uh, a German Democratic Republic or East Germany. And now he is a professor at Mahila Kiev University in Kiev. Now we're speaking to him. Uh, he is now in Germany uh, because of situation with his parents. And uh, um, Andreas, welcome to Chicago Jewish Cafe. Thanks for having me. It's a big honor and thanks for the kind in, in, uh, introduction. Uh, Andreas, uh, as I uh, mentioned to you before, um, I'd like to talk to you about the nature of the society that is currently is Russia. I mean, you were born in uh, German Democratic Republic. I was born in the Soviet Union. But Russia today seems to be neither this communist society or social society, whatever you want to call it, but totalitarian society where absolutely everything is controlled, but neither it is, of course, democracy. How would you describe it? Um, that's a good question. Um, I think the, the state uh, of uh, Vladimir Putin has become uh, clearly a dictatorship by now. Uh, the regime and um, the state is acquiring also partly totalitarian features in that the repression is um, actually uh, ever, ever more strictly and uh, that the methods that are used against uh, opposition voices are uh, already reminding of totalitarian and not just authoritarian regimes, uh, and that there's also an effort um, to mobilize um, the society, in particular for the war, the appearance of this Z sign um, and other uh, policies of Russia. Uh, we had that already after the Orange Revolution with the appearance of the youth movements. Um, they remind one of totalitarianism. It's not yet a totalitarian society and um, it's not yet a fully totalitarian regime, but the impulses one can clearly see and uh, uh, these are simply lessons learned from people like Lenin and Stalin that are now being again applied to one degree or another um, for the domestic and foreign policies of Russia. Um. I have a feeling that after February 24th, Russia has changed dramatically. Uh, it, not only because uh, the war, it began the war against Ukraine, but also because of its own self-conception. I mean, it seems like, you know, the voices of what I would call Russian Christian Orthodox fascism are growing louder and louder. Yes, I would agree. Um, and um, one could even see here um, this as a result, what happened on 24th of February uh, of a development that I would date began somewhere in 2020 with the change of the constitution, uh, the assassination on uh, Alexei Navalny, uh, then in 2021 with the imprisonment of Navalny and uh, since 2021, the preparation of the war with the um, amassing of troops uh, that then eventually led uh, to, to the large invasion on 24th of February. And since then, indeed, um, fascist voices have become louder in Russia and we can already see in certain documents and in certain phrases, in certain formulations that are used by official Russian sources, I would say fascist or semi-fascist elements. And in particular, this concerns um, those texts that are now appearing with regard to Ukraine, uh, where um, this language of cleansing, of rebirth, of renewal, of um, 
uh, of palingenesis um, is appearing that is typical of, of fascist uh, regimes. Um, uh, this is not yet, um, I would say, a fully fascist ideology uh, because it so far concerns largely the Ukraine issue. There's no uh, state uh, uh, sort of comprehensive um, ideology so far that um, uh, speaks of a, of a renewal of Russia, of uh, a, a reborn, newborn Russia, and um, of some sort of larger cleansing and, and repressions uh, within Russia. But uh, for the um, treatment of Ukraine, we have already this uh, language. And um, I would partly argue here that perhaps this can or be already be treated within comparative fascist studies, because um, we may see Russia and Ukraine as two different countries and the Russian nation and the Ukrainian nation as two different countries. But the people that are using this uh, quasi-fascist already language with regard to Ukraine, uh, this language of cleansing and renewal of Ukraine, they do not see the Ukrainian nation and uh, Ukraine as being separate from Russia. So they actually think um, about Ukraine as a part of Russia and are proposing um, a renewal of this part of Russia, uh, Ukraine, a cleansing of this part of Russia, of Ukraine, that um, is already close in its uh, rhetoric, in its direction, um, in its ideology, uh, close to, to fascist ideology. And uh, so um, uh, whether, whether one would then already be justified to call actually uh, Russia fascist altogether, that's an open question. There are uh, more and more voices who uh, also reputable voices like Alexander Motil, um, Timothy Snyder and others who um, are using the term Motil actually already for a longer time, but now also uh, Timothy Snyder. Um, and there are good reasons for that now. I think uh, much better reasons now uh, for the last three months uh, than before to use the term. Um, but um, there would be other, um, other comparatives would argue that for the whole of Russia, perhaps this term is still um, unnecessary to, to characterize uh, in, the Russian regime in, uh, in its entirety. Given what you just said, um, if I'd ask you in which direction Russia is developing, toward what kind of society? Because right now, the way I see it, it's neither here nor there. What uh, and and many uh, Russian uh, fascist ideologues who now call themselves Euro Asians um, used to be they called themselves National Bolsheviks, but now they call themselves Euro Asians. I mean, towards what type of society? And by the way, they used to talk about Russia from Portugal to Vladivostok. So yeah, you you are here. Uh, apparently uh, speaking of Alexander Dugin, I don't think that this sort of um, neo-Eurasianism is already um, the state ideology of Russia. What we can observe is a certain um, a congruence of, for instance, Dugin's, um, Dugin's writings about Ukraine already in the 1990s and later on um, concerning Ukraine and the current policies of Putin concerning Ukraine. So um, if you um, uh, read, for instance, the sections in uh, Dugin's perhaps most influential book, Foundations of Geopolitics, As Nove Geopolitiki from 1997, uh, the way he speaks there about Ukraine as an artificial state and as the um, Ukrainian Black Sea coast, um, have, which needs to belong to Russia, this is actually what uh, what uh, now uh, the Russian uh, mainstream is is uh, talking about, saying about Ukraine, and this is the policy that um, uh, Russia is now conducting with with regard to Ukraine. So there is a certain congruence here. I'm still not um, not sure that um, indeed people like uh, like Dugin they are influencing doctrinal, doctrinally uh, already directly the. Um, um, the Russian uh, uh, leadership. I think what, what these people like Dugin, Prokhanov, uh, Glazyev, um, and others have been indeed um, uh, creating 
in Russia over the last um, three decades, one could say, is, is a sort of uh, political spectrum in which fascism um, is a part, is an important part, and in which uh, fascist ideas play a legitimate role in the overall uh, conduct of, uh, of public discourse, political discussions, and, um, and even to some degree party politics. Renovsky was actually uh, um, uh, also for a while at least part of that when he was, in particular when he was proposing his last dash to the south and which uh, foresaw an inclusion of, um, of Turkey, Afghanistan and Iran into the Russian empire and the rebirth, a new birth of, um, of Russia via such a, a new expansion of Russia um, that was his program in the 1990s. So, the, but the, but these are just uh, the, the names I, met, I, I mentioned were are just some of these uh, fascist ideologues and and politicians. They are publishing a lot. They are voicing um, their ideas in, in Russian mass media, and they have contributed to, I would say, an overall shift of the. Um, uh, of the Russian political spectrum to uh, something I would call uh, the radical right. It's not fascist, uh, the, the mainstream is not yet fascist, at least not with regard to domestic Russian affairs, uh, but um, it's already um, you know, shaped by uh, far-right conspiratorial law and order, uh, nationalistic, uh, imperial imperialistic, uh, uh, ideas um, that do not yet amount to a fully fascist program for Russia, but um, that are moving in that direction. And uh, if it if it continues like that, then uh, we we may uh, indeed in a in a I don't know in a couple of years perhaps end up with a regime that would be then uh, which it would be then fully legitimate to call um, entirely fascist. So far, I would only use this term for the particular program and the particular discourse that has in the last three months developed in Russia with regard uh, to Ukraine. Very interesting. But my question is this also, uh, can Russia really be fully fascist state given the fact that it's multi-national, multi-cultural society? I mean, it would have to have a great civil war in order to somehow resolve this problem? Well, um, you know, the definition of the sort of, uh, of the ruling um, nation can be very flexible. And, and Russia has in the, in the past also been um, a sort of ambivalent um, state, uh, both in the pre-Soviet, uh, also in the Soviet times and in the post-Soviet times in that um, nationalities, they can be included into this sort of uh, ruling strata, and they, they are, may not be persecuted, uh, um, the, the non-Russian nations within Russia. So um, uh, the nationalism here can be, uh, does not have to be necessarily as ethnocentric and as racist and as biological as that of, of Nazism, which was also to, to a certain degree open. Uh, there was the sort of pan-German concept uh, in there, which also allowed um, other uh, Germanic or Aryan so-called uh, so uh, um, nations to participate in this, uh, in this fascist German project. So this is not something that unusual actually, that, the, that nationalisms are often, uh, they have this pan, um, uh, dimension and they ca can also incorporate uh, other nations into such uh, ultra-nationalist projects. Um, so I don't see that as a, as a principal um, issue. And we've seen that um, in the past in that the Russian ultra-nationalist movement has also included uh, non-Russians and uh, the Russian regime has prominent non-Russian actors. So, um, and so it was also in the Tsarist regime and the Soviet regime when it was more nationalistic, as for instance under Stalin, um, so this is not a, this is not, I would say, a, a principal issue in Russia. Mm, very interesting. So it's a different type of fascism that in Nazi Germany. Yes. Um, um, yeah, and some people would go as far as classifying um, uh, Nazism as being actually non-fascist because it had so many specificities, uh, the virulence of its anti-Semitism. Uh, the sort of biological racism, um, uh, uh, you know, this 
eliminationist, as it has been called, anti-Semitism was something peculiar and, and the Holocaust was, was peculiar. And some people say that calling uh, Germany fascist is actually a diminution of the Holocaust uh, mm -hmm. because it sort of, it puts it into a comparative framework that is not adequate for this particular um, crime. Very interesting. So uh, we're talking uh, uh, about possibly Russia becoming even internally more and more oppressive and the war against Ukraine serving in part uh, a way to redefine Russia, to bring Russia back to what it sees itself as a country on one hand. On the other hand, to galvanize different units of Russia um, around uh, its supreme leader or a a, a leader, whatever you want to call him, you know, Putin, I do not know if Putin has the, uh, uh, if they worship him, you know, like uh, uh, in some other fascist countries, you know, but uh, is this what we're talking about? But is this what we're talking about? Yes, um, I would also see it, uh, the current overall imperial project that Putin has is rather one of restoration than of creating an entirely new uh, uh, empire. He wants to basically get back as much as possible uh, of the Tsarist and Soviet empires. Um, and you know he wants to, uh, uh, at least uh, in terms of the territory, uh, restore uh, the Soviet Union, which he sees as uh, is well known, uh, the largest uh, geopolitical catastrophe of, of um, the 20th century. Um, uh, but this um, this project only, I think, uh, functions insofar, uh, or at least that is my hope, that it will only function insofar in, in, as it does not demand from the Russian population too many sacrifices. So the past experience of Putin with the uh, Russian-Georgian war in 2008, the annexation of Crimea in 2014, and also for the first uh, months of this uh, uh, large invasion of Ukraine since uh, February, this war has been that um, indeed um, these wars are galvanizing uh, the, uh, uh, the support for, for Putin. They are making him more popular. They are providing legitimacy for the uh, Putinist regime. Um, but uh, in 2008 and also in 2014, um, these, um, these extensions, expansions, they happened before the economic crisis then uh, that happened. So in 2008, the Russian-Georgian war was before the uh, financial, world financial crisis. And in 2014, um, the annexation of Crimea was before the, f the fall of the, uh, of the oil prices. And um, that's why these uh, events were by themselves then, uh, then relatively popular. And so far also the, uh, the large invasion of Ukraine has not led to, uh, to devastating effects uh, on the Russian economy um, and for the, for the life of ordinary Russians. However, um, once the uh, sanctions will finally kick in the effects of the sanctions, my hope is that this uh, appetite for foreign adventures in Russia among ordinary Russians will decline and uh, that will then hopefully also lead to a change of uh, Russia's foreign policies and, per and, uh, and perhaps even a, a change of the uh, Russian political regime. My feeling is that uh, these sanctions uh, will have absolutely no effect uh, on Russia. If anything, it will strengthen the uh, dictatorial nature of that regime. My only hope is that Ukrainians will find somehow strength with the help of the West to defeat Russia on the battlefield. But getting back to the nature of the Russian society. So basically, you're saying you, you mentioned, you know, before uh, Russian Revolution of 1917 and after Soviet Union. I mean, I have to say, uh, of course, after revolution, we got totalitarian state that uh, uh, Tsarist Russia did not even come close to. Uh, actually, in my mind, even Nazi Germany, in terms of internal repressions outside of the Jewish people, 
did not come close to what Stalin's Russia was with regard to its own population. Now, and I think it's in part a reflection of Russian political culture. And when I look back to 19th century, it seems like we're having the same thing, you know, Gorbachev, it was Alexander II, Tsar Liberator. Then there was tightening of the news uh, with uh, Alexander III, and then of course, collapse of this thing. Do you see a different uh, way of uh, developing this time for Russia? Uh, well, this would be, of course, an, an escalation, uh, a domestic and foreign escalation uh, in Russia that uh, would be disastrous. Uh, and that would then perhaps lead to indeed a full scale Russian fascism. Um, if, if this trajectory uh, will continue, uh, uh, but but my feeling is that you know that we are now in the 21st century and so this um this is all i would say conditional uh, these these adventures are uh, not possible in this world uh, the uh, the the russians have in the last 30 years gotten some impression of what life and freedom uh, means and um, they have uh, also now a consumer society. And I cannot really imagine that uh, people will be uh, then ready really to uh, sacrifice uh, uh, a significant part of their, of their living standards for mm. uh, you know, adventures in, in Ukraine, Syria, uh, Georgia, Moldova, and so on. And um, uh, that simply, you know, at some point, uh, uh, Russia, I hope, will normalize and and will be will become a, an ordinary um, nation state. Uh, you how mean exactly? Like, that you will... mean like Western European uh, society or China? We what is the normal state today? Um, I mean, normal just in terms of being basically content with uh, its current borders. Uh, the official. Uh, state borders of, of Russia. That would oh my be. Oh God! Uh, but Russia uh, was never content with its borders. It was always expansionist, in different way than, for example, other countries, England or United States or Europe. But but, but my my as I said, uh, this is just a hunch that uh, this is uh, that uh, the Russian population and actually there has been some research on this by. Um, a political scientist from Russia, Maria Snegovaya, who has shown that the support of the Russian population for these sort of uh, adventures in um, that Russia had in the past uh, in foreign affairs is um, the support is actually conditional, uh, you know, is actually connected to the oil price. That means to the socioeconomic situation of Russians, and that they tend to more support these. Uh, this adventurous foreign policy when the socioeconomic situation is stable and uh, that it declines when uh, when the uh, socioeconomic situation is worse. So um, I, I, I cannot really imagine now that, uh, you know, millions and tens of millions of Russians will be ready to sacrifice actually um, the, the, the modest living standard they have achieved in the last 30 years you know, for these, hmm. for these. Very interesting. And, uh, it, my feeling is that actually the 21st century is even more dangerous than 20th century and before. I mean, we live in nuclear age and Russians can change their mind at the drop of a hat when the real danger of nuclear war arises. They'll, they'll go and unite in the same way as any other society would. Well, I mean, we had the, we had this confrontation already during the Cold War, and there were much more nuclear weapons during the Cold War. Actually, the the amount of nuclear weapons has uh, since then uh, declined, and that was the logic mm. of deterrence um, uh, during the Cold War. And uh, we were actually on the brink, uh, for instance, in the early 1960s, in the early 1980s, we were we were on the brink of uh, of World War Three. Uh, so. Um, so in a way that that is not that novel a situation. I mean, one can only trust here in uh, in the fact that Russians, like other people, are not suicidal; that they don't want to have this uh, uh, World War Three. So, um, 
uh, maybe I'm too optimistic here that uh, this is a, a temporary phenomenon and that uh, this um, latest adventure of Putin will only function as long as um, the socioeconomic effects will, will be limited. That is why, for instance, uh, Putin is now trying to trade the opening of the um, export of um, Ukrainian grain against um, um, uh, against uh, you know ab abolishing san Western sanctions because he knows that these sanctions are going to have an effect and these sanctions are going to uh, undermine his political support in the population. I think that's uh, why uh, why he is concerned about uh, these sanctions. So um, um, so in the past, as I said, the uh, the popularity was high for. Um, the um, ex expansion into Georgia, the uh, one could say de facto annexation of Abkhazia and South Ossetia, and the de jure annexation of of Crimea. But that is um, that all was popular because it was low cost, um, uh, and uh, it seemed to be successful. It seemed to be easy. It seemed to be uh, to demand few sacrifices. Um, and that's why it was welcomed. And let's say the intervention in Syria was tolerated because also it, it did not have larger effects on Russian society. But now this war is gonna have large effects on Russian society. And my hunch is that uh, the society will then be more and more critical of, of this war. Mm, very interesting. Um, the way I see it, and correct me if I'm wrong, that Russia today is highly, highly unstable society and state, highly unstable. I mean, uh, look at this, just uh, Putin talking about him having some surgery or some uh, medical procedure, already shaking everything. Everything depends on Putin. He breathes, he looks, he sings, he doesn't sing, he sits, he doesn't sit. I mean, the whole country and the whole policy uh, depends on Putin. This is not a great country. This is a country on the brink of collapse. Now, some people want restoration of monarchy, and some people talk, what about one-party state like it was Soviet Union, like it is China? I mean, I do not know of what, what is the way for future of Russian development. How And, and how would it work? You, you talk about people talking, people thinking, and people... M Russian people have no voice the way I see it. I mean, even 1991, they had no voice. Some people become active, but, you know, the country develops under its own dynamics. And talking about people's voice in Russia is like nothing. Yeah, but then I would say in the late 1980s and early 1990s, one could even say throughout the 1990s, there was actually some, I would say, proto-democratic development in in Russia, we had actually once uh, Gorbachev allowed it. Yes, uh, but then also society uh, was was filling this space, and and we had then first the informal movement, then the uh, then this sort of uh, multi-party movement that then uh, multi-party uh, situation that emerged, and and there was some general political competition in the 1990s, maybe not for the presidency. But in, in the Duma elections, in, in, in local regional politics, there was some, some general competition. Uh, and now I think the, the stability of this regime has largely to do with the fact um, that uh, this particular regime has no procedure or method of succession. It cannot prolong itself beyond the life or the, let's say, the healthy state of Vladimir Putin. I th what I see as the main challenge of this regime is uh, to determine um, a successor in a sort of consensual way, uh, because the, the problem here is not so much that there is some sort of um, mobilized civil society or alternative uh, political forces or an opposition. Um, this is certainly now flattened and, and has been um, suppressed successfully by uh, by Putin. The problem is um, how do you how do you determine actually a successor? It may be easy uh, on a first glance, but uh, the problem here for 
for this circle of people around Putin is that if you uh, are not so yourself the successor of Putin, or if your clan does not get the highest post, you um, uh, are in a dangerous situation, as for instance, the, the fate of such people as uh, Mikhail Lesin or Alexei Ulyukhaev uh, illustrate. Uh, former ministers under Putin, Lesin has been killed in a Washington hotel. Um, Ulyukhaev is in, uh, has been put in prison. So, um, so the stakes are very high in this, uh, in this fight for power. And, uh, and there's no met method or procedure with which to, uh, to determine um, a successor. There has now been talk about perhaps a collective leadership after Putin, uh, but that is also something that, that does not really function in Russia, uh, because then within the collective, somebody has to be um, um, uh, on the first uh, uh, place. So, um, and I think the Russians know that, that uh, if, if there's no Putin anymore, if he is not healthy enough uh, to, to rule anymore, uh, and, and once he dies, then um, there is a problem. What, what happens then? Uh, what kind of political system is, is Russia going to have? And again, I'm maybe here overly optimistic. I'm, I'm actually foreseeing here some sort of political opening, perhaps even um, a sort of a transformation um, of Russian politics that would eventually lead to some sort of democratization, uh, uh, because the um, because the method then to determine a new a new who will be the new leader would then be actually uh, via via elections uh, that would uh, bestow the uh, um, uh, the legitimacy. Russia is not North Korea, and Russia is also current Russia is not any longer. Uh, the Soviet Union of the early 1980s. So um, I think this this regime is actually a dead man walking. Um, uh, what exactly will come after it, I'm, I'm, I don't know, but I have my doubts that this will regime will easily transit, transit to a new equilibrium after Putin leaves uh, uh, the stage. Uh, I, I would rather think that there will be a new regime. It could be a, a regime perhaps that will be even worse, um, a full-scale fascist regime, but I'm actually more optimistic and um, think that there will be an opening of the current regime. Well, we do not know. You may be right. Uh, but the way I see it, this majority of Russians um, have grown very, very disappointed with the collapse with, of the Soviet Union and with what followed. I mean, it seems to me that vast majority of Russians, especially those who support Putin, uh, feel that collapse of the Soviet Union was a humiliating defeat to Russian nation, however they imagined that Russian nation to be, and put it from a superpower status to, uh, to some second rate or third rate power. And this is what they're trying to get from under. And they're willing to kill in order to get there. I mean, that's my impression. And how far they can kill and how many people will kill, I, I, I don't think they care. You know, Russians don't like, uh, uh, what is it? The song goes, you know, do Russians want war? My answer is, unlike Yevtushenko's, they cannot live without war, especially war where a lot of people die in the process, including their own. Yes, for, for a part of Russian society, uh, certainly that is true. And, and the older generations, there may be many uh, who uh, have nostalgia towards uh, the Soviet Union. But the, but the younger ones, I wonder whether they, they really are up for this sort of uh, uh, global confrontation, new wars, uh, creating some sort of new empire. As I said, I think you know Russia to to a degree has has become a consumerist society, and these um, these expansionist adventures in the past they they've been welcomed or tolerated um, with an understanding that this would not touch upon some sort of basic uh, social and economic stability. And now, what uh, what Putin will uh, may get into. Um, by the end of this year or the beginning of next year is actually an economic situation that could become worse than the, than the dreaded 1990s, uh, when, uh, when entire um, branches of the Russian economy 
will start will start uh, 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 or will end functioning properly it, with, with as a result of the sanctions um, uh, uh, perhaps more so as a result of uh, sanctions on russian imports rather than on russian exports um, uh, so um, I mean, I'm not an economist. What I read, however, when uh, when I study what the econom economists say on this, that these sanctions are really um, uh, very effective, but but only with a delay, uh, and they that they will hit the Russian economy, and that uh, this will then also have repercussions for the living standards, and um, and then uh, I would expect the uh, the mood in Russia. Uh, to, to switch to uh, a different uh, uh, foreign political uh, doctrine. So you believe that as a result of these sanctions, uh, uh, Putin gov Putin's government will collapse, or dictatorship will collapse, and there's going to be new democracy in Russia? Uh, no, I think the, uh, the regime will collapse once Putin becomes unable to rule, for whatever reason. Uh, I think that the regime needs needs Putin. I might, you know, there, there are different schools. Uh, other, uh, there are other schools who say, you know, the regime will reproduce itself. I have my doubts that it can easily reproduce itself because of this uh, this clan structure of, and and the sort of zero sum um, uh, power fights that the different clans have within the Russian um, current regime. And, and they cannot resolve that easily because, as I said, you, if you are not on the top, you, you are actually, your personal security is in danger. So the stakes are extremely high in this, in this power struggle. Currently, Putin is sort of controlling this, this, uh, uh, this competition between different clans. But once he disappears as, as a balancer, um, we, will, we will get to a new uh, regime. That is my prediction. Um, what then will happen, I, I can't know for sure, but, uh, you know, we Germans, we, we used to be a very sick nation, uh, you know, until 1945, and we, we managed to finally uh, get away from our, at least from our main pathologies. I think we have still some, um, uh, some defects in our sort of worldview, but uh, we have become a I would say a much, uh, much more healthy uh, society. Uh, but it was only I, because you were defeated as a nation. Russia was not defeated. And Russia feels that it wants to be reborn and it wants to rule the world. Well, that would be then, if, if that happens, that is actually what you just <laughs> outlined was basically um, a fascist ideology, you know, a, a new birth of Russia to, to acquire a world hegemony that, that would be, you know, something very close to uh, what Hitler and Mussolini were also aspiring to. Um, do, do, but do you but know, I don't do, think that, that that functions in the 21st century so easily. Okay, talking about 21st century, do you know the song Kulikova Pole, Zana Bichevska? Uh, uh, yeah, I know Bichevska, she's a nationalist uh, sort of... Uh, um, very genre. popular, a very genre. popular yeah, yeah. nationalist. Uh, extreme nationalist singer. Uh, but I wonder how much this really, you know, maybe people, even people who like maybe the music, how much they are at the, at the end ready to sacrifice, you know, in terms of their, you know, income, in terms of health services, education, uh, you know, the basic stuff that people uh, care about. But now if somebody opens a mouth, even to say few things that, you know, no war, no more war, whatever it is, you know, they're uh, clamped down, they're, they're, they're expelled, they, uh, there's no jails yet, but, you know, people are flying all over the world. Uh, but the reason I mentioned Bichevska is because she has a song, the Skulikova Pole, which actually expressed in early 20, beginning of 20th century, expressed and repeated the Russian idea of what Russia really wants. And very prophetically, way before Russia occupied Crimea, the song is talking about Crimea as ours. Then it's talking about Constantinople, something that Erdogan should really know and think about it before he blocks Finland and Sweden from joining NATO. And then finally talks about 
the holy Jerusalem. Now, this is the line of Russian thinking. 20 years ago and continues to this day. And Israel should, should think about that. Really should think about it, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, I've studied that uh, for uh, very intensely. I've wrote dissertations on Zhirinovsky and Dugin and, and you know, this whole ideology. And um, yeah, but um, I don't know. I'm, again, maybe I'm, I'm too, uh, I, have, I'm, I have two rosy glasses here on, on, my, on my nose and I'm not seeing um, the reality. Um, I think this is all, you know, this is all good and fine for ordinary Russians, as I said, as long as it does not really sort of create these basic uh, economic social problems. And that, that is basically also the lesson from the 1990s, the, um, the time when Russia, when Russia retracted uh, from um, its empire were the 1990s, when it was in deep economic trouble. And currently, as I see it, uh, Putin is leading again Russia into this deep economic trouble. And um, uh, there will then be, uh, uh, I think the effect will be that Russians will become more introverted and, and, and start thinking about their, their daily, well, daily socioeconomic problems. I, I respect your opinion. Uh, my opinion, as you see already a little bit different, I do not see the current uh, uh, economic uh, uh, sanctions as a problem for Russia, quite not the yet, opposite. not yet. I agree, yeah. mm -hmm. but I see them as advantage for Russia because it forces Russia to galvanize its internal resources in the way that it was not before. That is number one, and number two, I see the war that boosted prices for natural resources. This is something yeah. that Russia exports as a big source of income for Russia. I mean, they're building three railroads going through Mongolia to China. So when we're there talking about that, there's no more gas exports, you know, to the West, there's going to be gas exports to the East. Yes, um, they will certainly try to compensate um, uh, for these uh, sanctions, but I wonder how much that works. Uh, and uh, the um, inclusion of the Russian economy into the world economy is deep and, and most of the Russian trade in the past has been with the West, uh, in particular with the European Union, but even with countries like the US. So, um, of course, China will partly compensate for that. Other uh, partners uh, around the world will compensate for that. But um, uh, I think that will be only partial and that uh, sooner or later, you know, every Russian will feel the effects of the war in his uh, or her own uh, uh, suitcase and in his uh, her own uh, budget, daily budget, and then, then my guess is that they will start thinking. You know, this is not what 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 we need. Okay, effect of the war. So let's talk a little bit toward the end of our conversation about what's going on in Ukraine in this war. I mean, it seems like you know, uh, Putin now is talking about just cutting off eastern Ukraine, maybe even. Uh, I do not know if he can get Nikolaev and Odessa. I mean, he got, you know, Azov Sea, he got this whole region now. Uh, what is your feeling about uh, where it's going and how will it end? At least until break. I do not know if it will end. I mean, Putin wants the whole Ukraine. Putin does not want Ukraine. Putin does not want, does not recognize Ukrainians as a separate nation. Yes, I mean, it's very difficult to predict what the Kremlin will decide because, uh, you know, from a rational point of view, this entire enterprise is, uh, uh, is going to be a big problem for Russia because uh, uh, with, the, with the annexation of Crimea and this pseudo-civil war in, in Donbas, um, that was still something that Russia could handle. The sanctions that were imposed after that were not that... Um, effective. They uh, diminished actually Russian economic growth, but now the sanctions are going to have, as I mentioned, uh, a deeper effect. So uh, what, uh, what the decisions will be in, um, in the Kremlin is difficult uh, to predict, but we've seen already that uh, actually the resources, the military resources of Russia are limited. Uh, we've seen that with, uh, with regard to, uh, to Kiev and to Kharkiv. And um, 
what they will eventually settle with uh, um, is difficult to say. Um, uh, and uh, and also what what Ukraine will uh, would agree to in a, in a ceasefire, let's say, is difficult to say. And um, um, and so far, at least, it looks that the support of the West um, is stable, is uh, has actually grown over the last three um, months, and uh, it will continue. And so, uh, the so-called correlation of forces—that is a, a term uh, that was used in in Soviet uh, uh, in Soviet discourse—has turned against Russia here clearly, uh, and Russia is now facing. Um, a front that is much broader than it thought it would be facing and a uh, much stronger um, enemy. So it's difficult to predict how this, uh, how this will end. Uh, I think the, uh, the end will only come when, um, as I see it, the, uh, the regime in, in Moscow will collapse. Um, uh, uh, I think then uh, we, will, we can really talk about uh, um, a withdrawal of Russian troops from from Ukrainian uh, territory. As long as, as Putin is in power, he will continue to uh, this war in one way or another, either escalating or or retreating. Um, uh, uh, frankly, I've, I've become sort of unsure about uh, you know um, assessing this and predicting this uh, against the background of the poor performance of Russia um, militarily in the last. Um, uh, three months uh, uh, and and the uh, apparent overestimation that many had, uh, uh, Russia had and Ukraine had and also the West had of the um, Russian capacity to conduct such a war and the resources and, and the professionalism and so on. So um, there's still a lot of, uh, of resources uh, and also military, military material uh, that um, Russia can bring into this war but how all of this will perform is uh, is anybody's guess. Mm. Well, very interesting. So basically, all of your hope is uh, placed on uh, rebellion of Russian people. Um, I wouldn't put it this way, but some sort of instability. Uh, the the regime change and the uh, retraction of the Soviet Empire was also not something that. Um, was initially came initially out of a rebellion of the Russian people. It was a sort of, in um, uh, it came initially from from Gorbachev. But then it created uh, social forces that demanded more uh, change, and then eventually it led to the breakup of the Soviet bloc and then of the Soviet uh, Union. Um, how this will play out with the current Russian regime, I don't know for sure, but uh, unfortunately we can only expect um, a major change in Russian foreign policy uh, with a different regime. Well, hope we'll see this different regime uh, in a few days. Yes, that's why I, what I also hope. Yes. <laughs> anyway, Andreas, I want to say thank you very, very much for your very uh, 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 insightful, at least to me. I'm going to think about our conversation uh, for a long while um, because it's a little bit different than the way I see it, but it's uh, 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 thinking of a very intelligent and knowledgeable person, so I need to consider it. In any case, I thank you very, very much, and I hope it's not the last time we see each other. And I, I hope so too. And I wish uh, the best to your parents. And uh, of course, uh, I wish the victory for Ukraine. Yes. You have a great day and the very best. You Thank too. you. Thanks for having me. It was a pleasure and honor. Thanks.